Do you need a break? You read my mind. Come with me. Hello and happy Thanksgiving to all of my U.S. listeners. I'm recording this on Thanksgiving Thursday, November 23rd, 2023. I'm Father Roderick. I'm a geek and I'm a priest. And that's what we're talking about. About this connection between the world of geeks and the world of faith. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And let me start by saying that even though we don't celebrate Thanksgiving Day here in the Netherlands, it's always a good reminder that we have to be thankful every day. And there's always something to be grateful for, even though sometimes the world that surrounds us may seem full of doom and gloom. But it also depends on where you focus, on where you look. So don't, of course, don't try to shut yourself out from the world around you. We need to be compassionate. We need to pray for, for, for you know, all that darkness to be um, hopefully um, counteracted by, by the light that God wants us to be in this world. But also don't forget to, to balance it out by, by looking at what's positive, what, what fills you with joy and with, with, you know, with hope. And for me, stories are that part of reality that always brighten my mood, even if I'm feeling down or I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged by what happens in the world. Um, the stories are always aspirational, and I love especially fantasy, science fiction stories. The stuff that I talk about here on the show, because those stories always, even though sometimes they may be about wars, they may be about strife, they may be about terror or uh, alien invaders or Daleks, um, they always end well. There's always a message that as long as you stay together, as long as you as you value friendship, then that strength, that bond between our characters will always be able to vanquish even the worst enemy. And, and we need those stories. I desperately need those stories, especially now. Speaking of Daleks, today is also not just Thanksgiving Day in the US, but this is also the day of the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Um, and I have this wonderful clip that I would love to play over uh, the, not over the speakers, as I was just doing, but I would like to play this over my roadcaster so you can listen to it too. It's a compilation, it's a one minute compilation of all the doctors ever since the birth of this wonderful science fiction show. <laughs> Always search for truth. My truth is in the stars. There is only one form of life that matters. Dalek life. What is your native planet? Gallifrey. I am a Time Lord. There's no point in being grown up if you can't be childish sometimes. You know the Daleks? Better than you could possibly imagine. We meet again, Doctor. You're expecting someone else? Hello, I'm the Doctor. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. Wrong. It's taken me all these years to realize the laws of time are mine. And they will obey me! You know me, the doctor. The oncoming storm. Timey wiping. Who are you? Oh, you know who I am. Oh, brilliant. Here we go. Something's coming for me. I can feel it. I so love that show, and it was great to see in this short clip. You can just look at uh, at it for it online on on Facebook, on the Doctor Who account, on various social media. You'll find this compilation. I was so happy to see my Doctor Who, Tom Baker, uh, featured pretty pretty heavily in this in this short trailer. Tom Baker uh, for me is 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 Doctor Who. Everything who came be everyone who came before him and after him were just substitute doctors. And this is because I watched Doctor Who f- from when I was in primary school until I was like halfway through secondary school um, or high school or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I, I still remember that this was a one of the rare foreign shows that were shown on Dutch television. At the time, we didn't have cable. Cable was somewhere in the future we heard that in the united states that land of of miracles and and technical uh future they were able to see more than 
just two TV channels. It, in my where I lived when I grew up, we had two TV channels, and it came in over the air. We had a black and white TV, and most of the programs, just cost wise, were were just uh, produced in the Netherlands, and we had our own um, our own production of uh, of fantasy and children's series, and and I, I loved all of those. But Doctor Who for me was just one of those moments where I could connect with stories from another culture. And even though it was just across the pond from England, it still felt very exotic. And this introduced me, even before Star Wars, to, to the world of fantasy and science fiction, especially science fiction, because Doctor Who does have some fantasy elements, but it's mostly science fiction. And this whole idea of a, an ongoing story, because all these episodes were interconnected, and oftentimes they would have um, storylines that would span several weeks and we would just watch one episode and then I would be ready in front of the television for, to see the, the, the next part of the story. A lot of those stories, um, when you rewatch them now, they feel very slow and ponderous and of course the special effects were really cheap. And, uh, um, but the storytelling was so good and I remember how that show made me feel like, wow, there's this amazing story and, and, and this is a series that has been started in the 60s, which to me as a child felt like an eternity ago. That was before I was born. That's how old this show is. And, and then to be in the middle of that ongoing story, I never thought at the time that I would still be a, a Doctor Who fan so many decades later. It's similar to Star Wars where I felt like, well, Star Wars is over and it'll never be back. So I'm just going to watch reruns. And now Star Wars has never been more alive. And the same is true for Doctor Who. We can look forward to new episodes of Doctor Who. There's going to be another, a new Doctor. And ever since they rebooted the series after this long hiatus, I think it's been amazing. Of course, you, you, you can have qualms about this or that episode or certain showrunners that weren't, you know, on the level of other ones. But in general... I have to say, it's fantastic uh, entertainment. And another thing that I really appreciate, and this, this trailer reminded me uh, of that, is how much the show itself is filled with hope. This Time Lord, this doctor who keeps generating into different forms and even genders, um, is from uh, from a, the planet of Gallifrey. And he's not the only Time Lord. There are many of them, but most of them will just observe what's going on. Yes, they are kind of timekeepers. But this doctor, our doctor, is the one who steps into history, intervenes and fights evil and tries to protect the weak. And that actually is almost like a subliminal mm, Christian message, I would say, because it is, in a way, a metaphor or an, uh, like a, 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 how you say that, uh, like a, an analog story to to the way people look at gods you know god gods are always seen or often seen as these entities that live beyond the realm of, of physics and time and space um and when you need them they're not there they don't get involved you you have to pray and you have to beg and you have to bring sacrifices to try to get them to do something uh, but they're pretty much hands off this is a reason why a lot of people don't believe in god anymore because it's like yeah god sure you you're delusional you know just let's do this ourselves because what is god going to do it, it's, it's, there is no magical uh, guy behind the curtains who is pulling the strings no as just a, a delusion that keeps us from actually becoming active. Well, this may be true for some religions, but Christianity, I think, is, is in a sense, a bit similar to Doctor Who in a, in, in a way that that, that God who, who sometimes seems very hands-off, becomes very hands-on, steps into our history, even though he himself is beyond time and space, and he becomes part of our life, and he gives his life to save us and to protect the, the, the meek and the humble and the sick and the orphaned, and thereby giving us uh, 
an example of how he wants us to be involved in this world. So it's never just about the doctor. The doctor in Doctor Who is showing what we can do. And, and the story is trying to incentivize us to not just observe the gloom and doom in the world, but to get involved and to follow his example and to, in the midst of all that doom and gloom and all the threats that can destroy life, to still have a sense of humor, to relativize things, to you know, laugh about it because ultimately it's everything is going to perish. You know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, as one of these doctors said in the in the trailer. So what have we got to lose? Uh, you only have one life. It's very short. So why don't you just follow the doctor's example? Or I mean, if you want to put this in a Christian context, why don't you follow in the footsteps of Jesus who actually gave his relatively short life here on earth to make sure that the people that are always marginalized, who are attacked from all sides and denigrated and excluded, um, have a place in his heart and are helped and are healed and are fed and are um, lifted up. That's, that's kind of the same dynamic and same kind of story. So anyway, that's my love for Doctor Who. I'd love to hear what you think of Doctor Who. Um, so let me know in the comments, oh, who is your favorite Doctor? What is your favorite storyline in the Doctor Who saga? And from Doctor Who, let's move into another galaxy far, far away. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. I would like to talk about some super, super exciting Star Wars news that broke this past week, or actually just in the last few days. The first one, and I think it's the, this is the biggest piece of news, is that Dave Filoni, the, the, the writer who started off as an assistant of, of George Lucas and was really formed by George Lucas into this the, the narrative of Star Wars and the deeper layers of Star Wars and, you know, what makes Star Wars Star Wars. He has been the creator of the, of the Clone Wars. Uh, he's, he's, he's been involved before he did Star Wars in, in, in other amazing projects like Avatar, The Last Airbender. That was all Dave Filoni. And then he, he, he worked for Lucasfilm, um, creating the Clone Wars, creating Star Wars Rebels. And now, of course, he's very important in the whole television um, era of Star Wars, where he was one of the co-creators of The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, <clears throat> now, of course, the Ahsoka series. Um, uh, he, he's got his hands all over the Star Wars universe, and he may be actually one of the, 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 the biggest heirs, you could say, of uh, the storytelling genius of George Lucas. The one thing that sets him apart from George Lucas, I feel, is that he is so much more... Um, let's say, a modern storyteller. Um, George Lucas often had amazing ideas and a, and, a, and a grandiose vision. But when it comes to realizing that vision, he was often way too much, like, on top of everything, micromanaging everything. Um, and I think that ultimately a number of the movies suffered from that, especially the prequels. Um, the, the second prequel movie, you know, it has its, its, its good points, but I'll... I'll um, it, it's really not on the same level as what Dave Filoni has shown to be able to do. So I feel that both story-wise but also production-wise, Star Wars is in very good hands. So what happened? He's appointed as the chief creative officer at Lucasfilm. He already was the like CEO guy. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I've <clears throat> been sick for the past few days, so if I get super excited... My throat gets agitated. Um, so he is going to be the one who is in charge um, of the overall narrative of Star Wars. And so he's also, according to uh, <clears throat> an interview that he gave with Variety, which I will link to in the show notes, he's also going to be involved in the inception phase. So for, uh, right now he was, of course, like at the inception phase of uh, Rebels, Star Wars Rebels and... Um, the the Bad Batch and um, and Ahsoka, but there were many other television projects that were just conceived completely without his involvement, and he would sometimes be asked for his opinion. Or he, of course, he's a, a great font of knowledge, so he he knows a lot about the the overall lore of Star Wars. So they would use him for that. 
but oftentimes, you know, some of these series, you, you can feel that it's a different type of storytelling and, and Dave Filoni wasn't involved. Sometimes that's also a good thing because, of course, Dave Filoni is, is just one is one storyteller. He's got one style, you could say. You, you quickly recognize when Dave Filoni has been involved. And so, for instance, for Andor... I think it's actually very beneficial that, that Dave Filoni was not involved in this, otherwise it would have not been the same show, I think. But we all agree that Star Wars needs a long-term vision and needs a certain coherence between all these different stories, especially now that they're prepping these, all these new cinematic uh, stories for us. And so this, I think, is very good news that to, to, to see that he's got a, a much more like a, an... an overseeing role now so that um, you get a bit more of a, <clears throat> a one clear direction. I think that they're learning from the things that went wrong with the Marvel Universe, and we, we, we spoke about that last week. So um, I, I think I, 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 I'm excited that they are choosing to have one guy who is overlooking everything when it comes to the, the way this story goes forward and and of course he's proven to 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 become better every year and one of the things that he said in the interview is like i i've, I've been hands-on so he's he's been making the move from animation to live action direction and he says that is going to help him so much because not only will he be able to advise other creators as far as the Star Wars lore is concerned, but he also now knows what it takes to bring a story to life in real, uh, in live action. And so he, he's, he's been kind of trying out all these different aspects of storytelling. And that makes him a much more experienced leader in Lucasfilm and at Disney than he was when he was only doing animation. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about this. <clears throat> And of course, he's already uh, working on on future stories as well. Uh, and, and this brings me to the next piece of news. Uh, I think it was in the same interview where they interviewed uh, the cast of Ahsoka. And especially Rosario Dawson, who plays Ahsoka, the adult Ahsoka in the series, has some very interesting tidbits. Notably, that she believes that um, it's very likely that there will be a second season of Ahsoka. Um, and Dave also spoke about that. It's like, yeah, we're considering doing a second season, which I think they would never be allowed to say if that wasn't already greenlit. So, um, and, and, and if obviously, <clears throat> this, this story needs a second season. You cannot just jump from Ahsoka, the television series, to directly to the theatrical movie that, in which Dave Filoni wants to bring all these story threats from The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett and, and Ahsoka together in one movie. Because a movie is so short. It's so little time for, you know, to do justice to all these different characters and storylines. So I feel like television is actually such an enhancement of the the way in which you can tell Star Wars stories and especially do character development, which is the forte, I believe, of Andor, and hopefully we'll also get a little bit more breathing room in a second season of Ahsoka. Um, the actress who plays Sabine um, says about this that that's her one regret, that in Ahsoka there was so much that was happening, so much that had to be told, that the evolution of her character, which is pretty important to the story, just didn't have enough room to breathe. And uh, she hopes that in the second season, she, that will, she will get that. She will be able to bring more nuance to her character. And I believe the same problem um, is true for Ezra, uh, who is played by a brand new actor. We've never seen him before. He doesn't get much screen time. He only shows up in that second half of the series. But Ezra is such a fundamental character to that era of Star Wars, and he needs more, he needs more episodes. So I hope that not only they will greenlight a second season, but that they will also give it a few more episodes. It's, this is a series that could easily be 12 episodes, like double the size, or do two seasons, Although there's always this this feeling that they're rushing things, that that's what I felt in Ahsoka, I was like especially towards the end, there's just too much they wanted to cram in, and it all feels a bit rushed. So let's hope that they they improve, um, and, and 
they've only shown to be a quick learner. And then the last piece of news was also very exciting. This was a piece of an interview with Daisy Ridley, who, of course, played Ray in the sequel movies. And um, she was at the Star Wars celebration in London earlier this year and was uh, announcing that she would be involved in another movie. And she would be back. Her character, Ray would be back. Now she has told us that she has already read the script for her movie. So it's out, it's done. The story is there. And she said, um, it's very different from what I expected, which makes me excited and super curious because the only, no, the only thing we knew about her movie is that it would feature an older Ray building a new Jedi Academy. So you immediately have, you, you base your idea of what that story is going to be about on what we already know about uh, about previous learning places like Dagobah where, where Yoda has his tiny little swamp academy and then before that we've seen glimpses of Luke Skywalker's attempt to form future Jedi and failing miserably at it of course which led to the big confrontation with with Ben Kenobi and then ultimately the 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 the, the birth of of Kylo Ren and so <clears throat> I kind of thought that they're probably going to do something similar, but no, apparently not. Apparently this is a different story. It may have that idea initially. And I'm thinking, so what would be so surprising that it could um, trigger Daisy Ridley? Like, oh, I didn't expect that. And I'm thinking, well, what if she builds, what if she turns to the dark side? We, we've seen her, like, uh, of course, her, her, her descendancy, she, she, she stems from, 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 uh, from Sidious. Um, but what if somehow her Jedi school is is not the light side, but it's like dark side? Although I would also immediately be against that idea. It would be certainly be shocking and surprising. But I kind of like the fact that Rey is, despite her heritage and her, the dark side like provenance, that she is able to be like purely light side it shows that it doesn't matter where you come from as long as you make the right choices in life you will end up uh, on the right side of history so there's something empowering about that as well we'll see um but it's it's very cool she hopes and thinks that fans are going to be very excited about the story um and there is a slight hint very very in between the lines that this may be not just one movie this, there may be other stories that they're going to tell. So, ooh, such a great time to be a Star Wars fan. The most beloved fantasy story of all time. It is the tale of a small hobbit and the great wizard who appeared to him one day. All right, dude, check it out. Go like that way, and then up this one mountain, and then kill all the hippies you come across. No, no, I'm searching for a dragon's treasure. I'm the wizard, you're the dwarf, and you will respect my authority! I am no dwarf! Let's talk about Middle-earth, and more specifically, let's talk about Rings of Power Season 2. Of course, this is a year without a new television series. I so loved Rings of Power Season 1. I know that it has its detractors and people that weren't happy with the way that that series was done. I thought it was amazing. I, I loved it. I, I really want to rewatch it, especially because the next season is only going to be um, uh, launched, uh, apparently, from what I've seen, I saw it like a movie poster. And it's a shot of, like, it's the camera is underwater looking up, and then you see through the ripples of the water, you see two silhouettes. And one, according to me, is Sauron, and the other one seems to be Galadriel, and they're standing side by side. Now, this may, of course, just be a, a, a fictional image or just hinting at their relationship, uh, so it may not actually be a real scene that we're, we're getting to see. But I thought it was interesting. Uh, it's it really cool to, and, and then, but you never know things lately i've been seeing some stuff on facebook and i'm i'm wondering like is this for real and then i google it and it turns out it's just a fan creation so i'm starting to get really confused people use ai to generate these images and it looks so incredibly realistic and that's one of the issues that i have with ai i i love it it gets me so super excited and then it turns out to be yeah it's just a fan creation we used to do that with photoshop of course but this becomes even even more realistic and and harder to see if this something is real or not i think that was it last week that i mentioned like a what if series about star wars where they would explore like variant timelines well what if 
Luke and Leia would rule the galaxy and would, uh, you know, and Darth Vader would have um, uh, still be their father, whatever. Uh, and I, I, I saw a poster and it looked so real and I was like, wow, that is such a cool idea because they did it very successfully with Marvel. But I think, I, I think that it was fake. And then the other day I also saw a glimpse of a, tra- I thought it was a trailer for the Skeleton Crew. Um, which is another Star Wars series that we're going to see. And I was like, oh, no, it's a, it was on Monday. I was so sick. I was in bed. I had a, a very bad um, cold and a headache and the flu. Uh, or not the flu, but I, was, I had a fever. And, and, and I was like, no, there's a new trailer for the skeleton crew. I want to react. I, wanna, I need to record a reaction video because that's, you know, and, and I'm sick and I probably won't be able to do something for at least a couple of days and then I heard nothing about it so it was probably just a fan trailer it was just but I believed it I thought it's like oh my gosh there's a new trailer got all excited and then yeah it's just anyway um so this poster for the for the rings of power um had a uh, a date for the new series and that would be September 2024 that sounds that sounds reasonable to me, September, like the fall of 2024. So at least I'm, I'm very happy that we know for sure that the Rings of Power, it, you know, they, they greenlit basically the whole series. So it's, it's not going to be suddenly canceled, even though they might not make their money back. But, you know, it's an Amazon Prime production. It's Jeff Bezos, he he doesn't even blink. Uh, it's a lot of money. It's one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive television production of all time. But Bezos just wants to do it. And, you know, he's got the money. Um, so we'll see. Uh, another hmm, series that wasn't as fortunate um, is uh, Leigh Bard- Le Bardugo's Shadow and Bone series. Um, it's a very popular young adult uh, book series. Also had a spin-off book series called Six of Crows. Um, I've read the first book and I was um, I I watched the first season or part of the first season, but I got very confused because in the television series they integrated a lot of storylines from the books that I haven't read yet, and they wove it into. This was one of my issues with the television series. It, there was. There were too many characters. I couldn't follow what was going on. The book was a lot easier to read, even a little bit simplistic. Um, I, I, I was like, ah, it's a bit predictable. And so the television series did make some effort to to uh, turn the story, uh, make the story a little bit more complex and add more layers, but it was a bit too much. I, I just didn't have the information. I suppose that for fans of the books that have already read everything, it was perfectly understandable what was going on, but I got lost. And so that's probably why I didn't finish the first season. They already filmed and um, I think it's already published the second season. Um, but then unfortunately they got the, Right after the second season was launched, uh, the news broke that um, there won't be a third season. And also the spin-off series uh, based on uh, Six of Crows, which, according to the fans, is actually the superior book series, um, is also dead. So um, the author was interviewed and she said it was such a disappointment and she was heartbroken. And I can imagine because it, you know, in terms of production value, it looked really, really good. But yeah, that's the way things go. It's so sad. Japanimation. Yeah. Ah! Cool. Let's talk about anime, one of my favorite topics, and maybe also the topic that I have the least in common with my current listeners to the show, uh, because um, anime is a bit more fringe than Star Wars and and Lord of the Rings. I'm fully aware of that, but I will try to talk about it in a way that gets you excited. As in the same way I got excited about certain anime series, certainly not everything, but anime is just another word for animation. So there are so many different genres, so many different types of anime, and some will be up your alley and others will will be completely foreign to you and will stay foreign to you, just as it is in my case. But I'm sampling everything. I'm depending on my TikTok followers to give me hints, and they know me by now. I've been doing the TikTok videos for about a year now. Um, so I do get very valuable suggestions and I'm checking out series that I would never have checked out, uh, if it were up to me, but I just, I trust my audience. And so th- this is how I've discovered Vinland Saga, which I talked about last week. 
and I've continued to watch it. This is also, for me, a way to handle my own television ADHD behavior where I would start so many different series and I would never finish any of these series. Um, but I, I now want to first watch everything Vinland Saga. There are two seasons out there. There's going to be a third season, but it's, no, it's not yet there. The manga, it's based on the manga, which is kind of the comic book story. Um, and often in anime, actually, the, the, the anime, the animated version looks very similar to the manga. The manga is beautifully done. It's a very violent story, of course. I've already mentioned that. This is not a story for kids. But it's also extremely well executed and it's very well drawn. Plus, it, it's, it's a good story. It's a really, it's a story with a lot of depth, um, which is something I would have never discovered had I only seen the trailer for Vinland Saga because it's all about the fighting. But this show is ultimately about peace and about, actually, I think about Christianity and about the incredible power of, of nonviolent faith. Um, but... It, you only discover the value, uh, the values of Christianity through a story that it's all about vengeance and 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 awful, awful, awful wars. Um, but isn't that close to our reality, where we live out our faith in a world that is very, very dark and where so much happens that is the total opposite of what we believe in, and that makes faith sometimes a challenge. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't come by itself. There's a lot that surrounds us that makes us wonder, you know, is this just a pipe dream, what I believe in? Or is this really feasible? Well, this story actually goes through the darkness to, to show you the light. And so what did, what did I discover this week? I watched a few more episodes. <clears throat> the boy, um, uh, Thorfinn, that we follow, whose father was murdered by Askeladd, who is a very evil um, guy from, I think he's a Viking from, uh, maybe he's from Iceland, I'm not sure. But anyway, he's a bad guy. Um, but since he murdered uh, Thorfinn's father, the boy is uh, has vowed to avenge his father by killing Askeladd. However, he's also hmm, a child of his father in a sense that he is a, he's a noble warrior. So he wants to exact justice um, by dueling with Askeladd. And Askeladd brings him along and he says, you know, if you do this, if you behead that guy um, that I want to kill, do it for me and you'll get another jewel. And then the boy loses another jewel. And, and, and Askeladd knows that the boy will not uh, uh, kill Askeladd in his sleep. No, it has to be a fair fight. The boy is actually too honorable <laughs> so so he he can manipulate uh thorfinn so or thorfinn is a little bit older now and this these the next few episodes that i've seen and i still need to create a, a tiktok about it is about the siege of london which at the time in you know the year 2000 i think it's the year 1012 or around that time is is already a a, a very a, a burgeoning city lots of co commerce they built this big bridge over the river thames um, that is almost like a fortress in itself. And Askeladd wants to conquer London, and so he's got a lot of Vikings with him, and they are unable to win because there's this big guy, um, a huge Viking, um, who is fighting with the Londoners. And um, even though he's a Dane, he's a Viking himself. And so Thorfinn is tasked to behead Thorkel the Tall. That's the name. So I'm like, wow, cool story, but how historical is this? Well, I did a bit of Googling, and it turns out, well, yeah, actually all these characters did exist. There was a giant Viking cor called Thorkel the Tall. Uh, he was a very, very evil guy. He had kidnapped an archbishop um, because, of course, the church also represented power and preached the total opposite of the values that the Vikings, well, the lack of values of the Vikings. Um, and we already know from history that um, some of these Christians were very effective in converting Vikings, the ones that settled in, in, in parts of, uh, of England, um, to Christianity. And so for a lot of the pagan Vikings, these Christians had to be eradicated. So this, this huge giant Thorkel the Tall kidnaps this archbishop. And then while he holds the archbishop in captivity, the archbishop is starting to convert his own fighter. So lots of Vikings are being converted to Christianity and they, they, they defect and everything. So Thorkel is getting more and more enraged and in, in, during a night uh, where all his soldiers get drunk, they 
they murder the bishop. I'm not sure if that's going to be in in um, Vinland Saga, but it was interesting to discover that part of of, um, of history <clears throat> and, and church history, because that's what it is. There's also another character that was intriguing. There's this Danish king who is sent to England as well, uh, part of the Viking invasions, by his father. His father is a horrible king, very cruel, very, you know, he really wants to vanquish the all the, you know, the Isles of, of England. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, so he sends his son to, and he knows that his son is uh, ridiculed by most of the other Vikings because he's a bit effeminate, effeminate how do you say that? He's a, he's a bit weak the, the reason for that is he's actually christian so he prays a lot he's very he looks very fragile he's got long hair almost like a girl he doesn't want to fight and so he f- refuses to engage in a battle uh to to conquer london and and thorkel is like huh so that's that's the prince oh uh, i'm gonna get i'm gonna capture that prince you know he's that that will be my prize um and then he, it, the, the Thorkel is just enraged that the prince doesn't attack him because, well, he's always in his tent praying to a crucifix. And so ultimately he, he ends up kidnapping the prince. And the prince is called Canute. Um, and it turns out his story is also true. This, is the, this really was a, a prince, a Danish prince, who ultimately in the 11th century became the king of not just England but also of Denmark and Norway and part, part, partly also king of, the, of certain Swedes, he said. Um, and because he was a Christian, he was able to build a bridge between the Vikings and the pagan world and the, and the, and, and the Pope. The Pope was actually looked very favorable upon, upon King Canute. Now, this happens later on in his life, but I wouldn't be surprised if that is also going to be part of Finland Saga. I've only seen some episodes where we, we get introduced to him, and it's like, yeah, how is this boy going to win the war? And it's kind of sad to see how much he's ridiculed by the other Vikings just because he's a Christian. Um, but apparently, that's just the beginning of his story, and he's going to grow into a great leader. I can't wait to see how much of that we see in the series. Now, of course, in the anime, he does meet Thorfinn, which is... Thorfinn himself is also based on a, a historical character. Most of, the, of Thorfinn's story is, uh, is made up, and also the encounter between Canute and Thorfinn is probably fiction. But it is also a way to introduce us to these important characters in church history, in medieval history... Uh, through the, 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 by using this connection that we already have with Thorfinn, who, who becomes our guide through Viking history. You know, this, this kind of stuff, this is why I love anime so much, and especially this series. So if you have access to it, I think it's on Netflix. You may want to check it out. And that wraps it up for this, um, for this episode, this Thanksgiving episode of my show, The Break. I hope I gave you some ideas on what to do when, whenever you have a break. And I hope you have a great break if you are currently celebrating Thanksgiving or the day after, which is like cold turkey day. <laughs> like all the, all the leftover turkey is used in many, many different recipes. I so wish I could join you. I've, I've been in the U.S. twice for, for Thanksgiving. And it was one. Both, both times it was such an amazing amazing experience so i hope you have a wonderful thanksgiving day i give thanks for you and i'm also extremely grateful for my for my supporters over at patreon.com slash father roderick um you may be one of them um and if not if you would like to help me to continue what i do and i really need your support <clears throat> because uh i love doing this work and i would like to continue but someone has to pay for it and the pope doesn't send me any money so if you can, if you have the means, one of the ways that you can say thank you to me for what I try to do with with my mission, um, then just take a look at my Patreon page and maybe consider becoming a, uh, one of my sponsors. Take care. God bless. Happy Thanksgiving.
All right, that was the first part. Now I'm going to record the part for my patrons. So this was about 40 minutes, right, in total. <clears throat> so it means I've got about 20 minutes for the rest. That would work. So I'm going to call Siri again. So please cover the ears of your own Siri devices. Hey, Siri. Hmm. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for 20 minutes. Hmm, she's not listening. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for 20 minutes. Oh, come on. Meow. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for... Why is she not listening? Siri is one of the worst digital assistants that I know. And now I need to do it manually because she's just not... It's just, it just stops listening. <sighs> alarm. No, I don't need to do alarm. I need to do timer. Because alarms are for waking up. Where's the timer app? Isn't that ridiculous? I could also tell Google to do this for me. Uh, old timers. Let's do plus a new timer. I want to do 20 minutes. This is so much more hassle. And then start. All right. I don't have books, so I'll switch straight to... What's this button? That's Star Trek. We'll just do this one. I need help. You need a teacher. I can't teach you. Maybe the internet has the information I need. You know what I learned from the internet? I understand that you have learned a few new things. There really is so much to learn. I've got a few new things for my patrons because if you're listening to this, that it means that you are part of my patron community for which I am extremely thankful, not just on Thanksgiving Day, but every day because you make it possible to do what I do. So um, this is the segment where I share with you what I've, learned and discovered on the wonderful in the, in the wonderful world of the internet and uh, one of my major sources of inspiration is of course youtube tiktok those video platforms and their algorithms always help me discover so much and to learn so much um, and this week one of the things that has really helped me practically is um, uh, a number of uh, stories that were shared by um, people that are suffering from ADHD and also have been diagnosed with ADHD. Now, this is maybe something that I've not shared on the break, but I do talk about this in last week's and the week before that episode of The Walk, which is my other podcast. Um, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's very, very likely that I have um, adult ADHD, and I actually have been suffering from ADHD symptoms for all my life. I just didn't recognize them. It also runs in the family. My brother has it. Um, my my uh, two, two children of my sister's family have it. Uh, maybe it's also part of the rest of the family, but we don't know because, well, it's, it's, it was not very commonly diagnosed in the past. But learning, I've read a couple of books and I'm st really started to see the light as like, oh my, this explains everything. It's, it's uncanny how many aspects of my life um, are, are, have been in, impacted by this attention deficit. They call it attention deficit, but it's, it's much more complex than that. There are also different forms of this. But it, it, the, the main cause of these symptoms is that my brain is, it doesn't get enough dopamine, which is like it's not stimulated enough. And so I'm always on the hunt for for new stuff that gets me excited. It gives me these little shots of dopamine, whether it is, you know, browsing social media platforms, but also starting new projects. And then after a while, the these, these things don't generate enough dopamine anymore. It's not new and exciting anymore. So I drop them because, you know, I don't find the motivation anymore. This is why my life is littered with sometimes also literally littered in my house is covered in, in unfinished business, unfinished projects. This is why I've learned to cope with all these things by establishing all these routines and by making certain commitments that I feel I have to ex express and, and announce so that I can help, uh, hold myself accountable and so that other people hold myself accountable. Uh, hold me in accountable. One of which is that I make podcasts every single week. I don't want to miss a single week unless I'm on vacation. That's where I grant myself permission to uh, to take two weeks off. But for the rest of the year, every week, I record the walk and I record the break. Um, and I do this because it helps me. 
It incentivizes me. It gives me that extra urgency, sense of urgency to show up. I try to do that also with some other projects, but not as, you know, not I'm not as strict with that. So I do my TikToks, but I, I want to prevent myself from falling into um, burnout, like TikTok burnout, like I had last year where I was making all these short videos and it took me a lot of time because I I didn't have the wonderful iPhone that I have right now so it was much more cumbersome to create these videos Um, and I was just trying to do too much uh, at once and so I I just got totally burned out on that took me about a year to get back to TikTok and now I'm just posting a video whenever I feel like it and the result is that actually the quality of those TikTok videos is so much better and so much fun. It's really fun to make those videos, especially because there's no, it's not obligatory. It's not compulsory. Um, and the same is true for the, the Gospel for Geeks, which is, um, you know, these like one minute homilies, usually in the form of a, a short video. Um, I hoped to be able to do that every week, but there are just weeks that I, I just don't have an idea. Um, I, I know what to preach in church, But then for the Gospel for Geeks, I always try to find like a a story or a movie or whatever, a segment that could um, help illustrate the Gospel. And sometimes I just don't, I just nothing. I'm I'm drawing a blank. Um, And at first I felt super guilty about that and I would record it even like on, on Tuesday or Wednesday after the Sunday, which completely you know, misses the point of doing the Gospel for Geeks because it's meant as a video that prepares people for Sunday. Um, but I, I, I've posted a, a number of them and I, I'm now seeing that on TikTok, these videos actually become evergreens. People will get these, these, the algorithm of TikTok serves these, still continues to serve these episodes and they're, they're liked. People comment upon them sometimes weeks after that particular Sunday. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more relaxed and thinking, well, you know what? I'd rather make some very good um, videos where the analogy between a particular movie or whatever seen in a, in a television series and the gospel is, is clear, also clear for me than that it becomes this forced thing that I'm like constantly in stress about. <clears throat> the more I'm stressed about something, the less... It works creatively. So that's why maybe not every week there will be an episode of the Gospel for Geeks, but the ones that I do post continue to do very well over time. So that's all stuff that I'm learning by by learning from other ADHDers. Um, And every week there are new things that I discover and that click with me. It's like, oh my goodness. So that is also part of the problem. I mean, that's that's part of the symptoms. I had no idea. I thought everybody had this. Um, one of the things that I discovered just this week is um, that a lot of ADHDers have the tendency to plan a lot in advance. It's to kind of counteract the chaos in their minds. But the problem is that if you plan a long time in advance, it becomes it loses its potential to generate um, dopamine. So it becomes like a chore, something that you dread, something you have to do, and then it becomes harder and harder to do. It's like, oh, that's so me. If I, I've tried to do this for years where I was trying to, oh, you know, in the month of January, I'm going to do that. And then in, in March, I'm going to do that pr- pr- production. That means I travel in that week and then I have two weeks to edit it and I'll put... None of those plans ever materialized. It's just because I was like making this super plan, but that's not how my brain works. I'm at my best when I create like margin in my life. And in that margin, when when I have, when I feel motivated and I get excited about it, I can get into this hyper focus, this flow, and then I can really do good stuff. But if I plan it out, if I try, if I make it, to, if I fixate everything, it, I, I don't have the energy, I don't have the motivation, and my mind finds a ton of excuses not to work on that one thing that I planned. So um, it's in, very instructive. It, it also explains why certain things that I felt like uh, I can do them ability-wise, I do have the time. Why, why can't I do this? Why can't I finish this? Well... It's part of my ADHD. Um, uh, also, ADHDers love tidiness. That's 
true. I love it when my kitchen is super tidy and well organized. But in reality, they are often very chaotic and they make a lot of mess. That's so me. That's so me. I am able to create a very organized home and then you blink and the next day it's a total mess. And then I'm like, oh, no, I need to control this because, of course, if my house is messy and it's got stuff all over the place, my brain gets triggered too much. So that's why I need to have my room super like, clear. This is one of the reasons that I love having this big monitor because I can then organize all these windows that I use while I'm recording a podcast and I don't have to click. It's just there on the left are my show notes and the center is the image that I'm that I'm streaming. On the right are the, the 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 browser windows with the videos that I need to be able to play. And then on the right of that, I have this long list of reactions so I can monitor the chat room. I've always struggled with these tiny monitors where when I'm talking, I needed to click maybe with my mouse and looking for that one tab and and and, and now I'm like, wow. This, is, this, this monitor is made for people like me. Um, and then the, the last thing that I really recognized in stories of a, um, a number of people on TikTok that have ADHD is the difficulty they have falling asleep or when they wake up during the night to go back to sleep. And, and that was super relatable. My head is always, always full of ideas and I have a lot of trouble shutting, shutting it down. Uh, even when I'm watching a movie, uh, I can still, like, there's another part of my brain that is constantly thinking in terms of, oh, can I do a podcast about this? Can I do a video about this? And um, it's very hard for me to fully enjoy something and to be in the moment because my brain is constantly, like, on a different track. This happens also when I want to go to bed and, uh, and I've been, for instance, recording a podcast too late then my brain is still hyperactive and I can't sleep. I had this the other night. I woke up at six o'clock in the morning and I had only slept for six hours. I'd gone to bed at midnight and I knew that, well, I need eight hours of sleep um, and, and I really value my sleep. I, the more I sleep, the, the better I function and the more creative I am. So I, I knew I had to sleep for two more hours, but my brain was awake. And, and then in, in, the, in cases like that, my brain's like a cat. Like cat owners will know this. I don't have a cat, but I know people that have. Uh, when the cat wakes you up at six o'clock in the morning, it's like meow, meow, which means I need to be fed. I am hungry. You will now obey and rise and you will not go back to bed. Well, my brain is like that. My brain is like meow. I have an idea, I, I want to do stuff, I have not one idea, I have 10 ideas, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to, and I'm like, like, shut up, I want to go to bed, I need to, I need two more hours of sleep, and my brain is like, meow, no, meow, meow, come, rise, <laughs> give me attention, I have dopamine, I need to do something, so um, I'm still trying to figure out ways how to call my brain. Um, what I do now, and it's a bit of a clunky solution, is I, I listen to a podcast. I put in my earbuds um, and I start listening to whatever podcast. It can be a political podcast, can be a movie review. And that helps actually to drown out the meowing of my mind. <clears throat> so I don't here, my brain, my brain is like, okay, uh, he's listening to a podcast. So, yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll leave him for another two hours. The problem is listening to a podcast, of course, does not allow me to go into, into deep sleep. So it's almost like a slumber. I'm half asleep. I do rest. It's better than, than waking up completely, but it's not, it's not perfect. So I'm still trying to figure out ways to, to call my mind. One of the one of the best ways is probably to um, establish a, a m even more fixed schedule when I go to bed and when I wake up. And uh, But anyway, I'm making progress. At least I now understand why my brain keeps meowing at me. Um, then something totally unrelated, totally different. Um, Apple VR. Of course, the Apple is, is working on their first AR set, the, the Vision, whatever they call it. I are they calling it a visual computer or something like that? Anyway, 
<clears throat> we all know <clears throat> that this is a big gamble for Apple, but what they showed us last year, or this year actually, um, last WWDC, um, is, is clearly one of the best, if not the best, AR VR headset on, on the market. Um, and it's only the beginning. This is like the first iPhone. Remember the, the very first iPhone? It wasn't able to, to have apps. Everything was web apps. And if you compare the first iPhone to what the phone is now... This is this is what Apple is is envisioning for their AR VR technology. They the first version is super expensive because they need to partially recoup all the investment, but they want to first put something in place that they then can it, in iteration improve upon. And I think that fifteen years from now, it, it will be a totally different product. But the groundwork is put in place now. The only thing that Apple was looking for was um, a killer app. What is going to be the, the system seller? And it's not games. Um, <clears throat> you can play VR games on almost every headset. Um, other applications like navigation, the headset is too bulky. It's You cannot use it outdoors. You, well, you can, but it's, it's, it's not there yet. So what is going to convince people that they need it and they need it now? Well, that killer app may very well be not on the glasses, but maybe on your iPhone. And it comes in the form of 3D video, which was a big thing a while ago, like 10 years ago, when everybody was convinced to that they needed a 3D TV. Um, and I remember actually having a Sony camera that was able to capture 3D video. And I used it uh, during World Youth Day, um, but then couldn't really play it back. Um, well, now in iOS, what is it, 15, 16, 17, 18? Apple has enabled, um, is using the, the, the lenses on the Pro models to actually generate a 3D image. And they created um, a format for those videos. And it turns out that that is an open source thing. You, anybody can write an app that can take that footage and convert it, not just for the Apple vision, but also for um, 3D TVs or other headsets. And someone has already created an app that you can just feed it with the footage that you shoot with your iPhone and then it will convert it to side-by-side -side, um, MP4s that you can then just feed to your other 3D device. I'm so happy that I held on to my 3D TV. I still have an LG 3D TV and it can play side-by-side -side video. Um, so I'm, I'm so eager to try this out. It's not available in the final build yet of the iOS <clears throat> system, but I'm very tempted to, down, to, to download the, the uh, what is it, the, the, um, the test version of it. Um, people always tell me, don't do that because it's your work phone. Don't, that software is still going to have bugs, but I'm so eager to try this out. I love 3D. And especially since I can probably play it on my 3D TV, I can't wait to start filming with that. Um, and I, I, I probably will start filming in default in 3D just because I know that in the future, this will become such a killer app. There is something about 3D video that is so superior to what we are able to do now. And the, it's like when when th HD became a thing. I, I immediately tried to film in HD, even though my colleagues in television, they all said, oh no, it's going to take forever for that to become the norm. And look at this. I was right. Now it's all 4K and I never filmed anything in 4K. I, I wish I had. Uh, but so now with my phone, of course, I'm always filming in 4K because that's the current norm. You always want to be at least on par with what standard is right now. And then maybe, you know... With, with 3D, it's going to be the same. I, I guarantee you, once this becomes... It's just that, that it was always a bit clunky to play 3D stuff. But with these with this technology, it be, can become very, very common. And so whenever I go on a trip and there is something that is... You know, like the world is in 3D. Why not capture it in 3D? I, I can't wait to start working with this. Now, let's hope that will be easy to also edit with this software because I don't want to go back to Final Cut Pro. 
I really want to do this in DaVinci because that's my, my tool of choice. I'm not sure if that is possible yet, but um, I am, I'm so eager to start working with this. It's going to be the future. This time for real. All right. And the last thing I wanted to share with you is has to do with AI. Now, this has been a very turbulent week for AI. You may have seen this all the bruja on the news with um, the, the CEO of OpenAI, etc. Um, I won't step into that mess because it's very complicated. But AI, I'm always very intrigued by the creative possibilities. So I found this also thanks to TikTok, um, this website. And it's called needsmoreboom.com. Literally, just type that into your browser, needsmoreboom.com. And then it shows you a window, or a, uh, how do you say that? It uh, um, a, a, looks a bit like a, like a very rudimentary Google page. And it reads, needs more boom. Any scene directed by Michael Bay. Michael Bay, of course, the guy who directed transformers and uh, that the disaster movies etc now here's the description do you feel like most movies have a serious lack of explosions a troubling shortage of black hawk helicopters who among us hasn't watched titanic and thought what this movie really needs is a mechanical shark with a machine gun on it don't worry we got you just enter your favorite movie scene and our team of tiny transformers will redirect it like michael bay the way it should be and so then it has the window and you can type in any scene. For the example that they give here, the pottery scene in Ghost where Sam and Molly get sexy. I didn't type that in, but I had two scenes where I wanted to try this out. And I tried to find scenes that are like the opposite of a Michael Bay scene. The first one is a scene from The Lord of the Rings where Frodo leaves for the Undying Lands. It's the final scene that takes forever and ever and ever. Of course, in Lord of the Rings, Frodo leaves with the elves for the Undying Lands. <clears throat> and he's there to say goodbye to his friends, Sam, Mary, and Pippin. So I typed that in, and then it took a few minutes, and then it gave me this script. And I'm just going to read it to you. Fade in. Exterior. The docks. Day. A massive ship gleaming under the sun, is on the edge of the water. The score is pounding, a mixture of heart-wrenching emotion and adrenaline-pumping action. A long tracking shot reveals Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin standing a distance from the ship. Frodo says, I'm leaving, Sam. Tears well in Sam's eyes. The camera zooms in, capturing the pain etched on his face. And Sam played by Sean Austin, says, You can't. Not now. Not after all we've been through. Suddenly, a deafening roar as a helicopter swoops down. The camera whip pants to show Gandalf, played by Ian McKellen, hanging from a ladder. Gandalf, no time to explain, Frodo. Gandalf throws Frodo a rope. Frodo catches it, and with a running start, he's hoisted into the air. The fellowship watches, mouths agape, as Frodo ascends. Suddenly, Sam, Mary, and Pippin are engulfed by the shadows of three giant eagles. Sam, eagles, they're back! The eagles swoop down, their talons extended. In a series of quick shots, they grab Sam, Mary, and Pippin, lifting them into the sky. The camera pulls back to reveal the chaos from a bird's eye view. The panorama of Middle Earth is laid before us, punctuated by the shrieking of eagle, eagles and the whirling of helicopter blades. The camera drone shots the ship as it begins to sail. Gandalf drops Frodo onto the deck just as the eagles drop Sam, Mary and Pippin. The fellowship share a moment of shock and then erupt into laughter. The camera takes a dolly zoom into each of their laughing faces, capturing their joy and relief. Suddenly, the ship is rocked by a massive explosion. The fellowship is thrown off their feet as debris flies everywhere. The camera whip pans to the source of the explosion. A small, innocuous pipe of Gandalfs, forgotten on the dock, is smoking ominously, having inexplicably exploded. As the ship sails off, the fellowship, shaken but unharmed, share a moment of stunned silence. And then once again, they burst into laughter. The camera pulls back as the ship sails into the sunset, the fellowship's laughter echoing, fade out, to be continued. 
Cue explosive action music. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm so glad that Michael Bay didn't direct The Lord of the Rings. Now, on to the next, the next movie scene that I was dying to see in a Michael Bay version. Okay, so what is more moody and melancholy feeling like the moment that Luke steps out of the homestead on Tatooine and watches the twin sunset. Um, it's one of the most beautiful moving scenes in A New Hope. Uh, there's absolutely no action in that scene. There's this beautiful, calm music by John Williams. So what if this were directed and written by Michael Bay? Here it comes. Fade in. Exterior. Tatooine. The Lars Homestead. Day. A barrage of fiery meteors rain down on the era Tatooine landscape, triggering explosions in the sand. Luke Skywalker, the blondest farm boy in the galaxy, watches in awe. A gigantic, transforming space robot lands beside him, a metal giant known as Optimus Skywalker. <laughs> he hands Luke a glowing lightsaber. Optimus Skywalker... Luke, you will be the last Jedi. Luke Skywalker, but I was going to Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. Optimus Skywalker scoffs, transforming into a huge hovercraft speeder hybrid. Luke hops on, the engine roaring to life. They speed off, leaving the homestead behind, a trail of dust following them. They pass by a herd of banthas, startled and stampeding. Luke skillfully navigates through the chaos. A drone shot reveals they are being chased by a pack of Tusken Raiders on jet-powered sand crawlers. I don't know how to picture that, but anyway, jet-powered sand crawlers. Optimus Skywalker transforms back into robot form, grabbing the Tusken Raiders, flinging them into space. They explode like fireworks, obviously, a spectacle against the twin suns. Luke gazes at the spectacular sunset, the two suns setting the horizon ablaze. The epic orchestral score swells. Luke Skywalker, I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. Suddenly, a meteor descends from the sky, heading straight for them. Optimus Skywalker transforms into a space jet shooting up into the atmosphere. Luke clings on, eyes wide. They dodge the meteor just in time. It crashes into the planet's surface, causing a massive explosion. Chunks of flaming debris rain down, each piece exploding upon impact. The crashing crescendo of the score is cut off abruptly as they land back at the homestead. Luke dismounts, staring at the burning wreckage of his home, his face filled with determination. Luke Skywalker, I am ready. Suddenly, a stray piece of debris falls from the sky, landing on a rusty oil can near Luke. It explodes in a spectacularly disproportionate fireball, launching Luke into the air. The screen cuts to black as an alien frog croaks a hilarious, I've got a bad feeling about this. Fade out to be continued. <laughs> Love this. Oh my goodness. Artificial intelligence. The times we live in. Hope this was uh, enjoyable to you. Again, happy Thanksgiving and have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, may the force be with you. And of course, thank you so much for your support and, uh, and, and just to be part of the community. I always have such a great time hanging out with you on Discord or in the chat room of the, um, of the Patreon app. Also, I want to thank my visitors, my live visitors in the chat room. Always really great to see you. Um, and uh, there's a lot of laughter in the chat room about the Michael Bay version of The Lord of the Rings and A New Hope as well. So maybe, maybe I will do this every week. This could be a really fun little thing. Maybe actually I could do this also on YouTube, I'm thinking. These, these scripts are just too funny. And it also gives me an occasion to do voices and do a bit of dramatic reading <laughs> I should add some sound effects and explosions for real anyway again as I said um, say my my, my uh, hello to uh, to the turkey 
and um, and we'll talk soon. Be good, and see you soon. <laughs>